Um, my name is Lam Fettering, and today I'm going to talk about the Systemd journal. Um, I already gave the keynote uh, yesterday, so I'm not sure if I still need to introduce myself. Um, the Systemd journal is a, is a relatively new component of, the, of uh, Systemd that we added in the, in the beginning of the year. And um, I've uh, not uh, really done any public speaking about the journal until today. Um, but uh, now we, we think it's uh, um, robust and stable and complete enough so that it could uh, really use some wider exposure. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, begin. Um, let's first ask ourselves, um, what, what, what's the current situation of logging or the previous situation of logging on Linux? Um, on Linux and uh, all the other Unixes, um, um, they, they all come with one service um, called syslog. And one way or another, like there are a couple of implementations, like uh, there's R syslog, syslog and G, syslog D, and a couple of others. And um, the question is, uh, um, are they awesome the way they are? Um, can they be improved? Um, or um, I mean, the interesting thing about syslog is that uh, basically it was invented in 1983 as a part of or as a component related to, to sent mail. And in 1983, that's, that's 30 years ago, basically, um, computing was very different than it was today. So how come syslog uh, barely um, evolved since then? I mean, um, since then, um, computers changed so drastically in every possible way. But syslog, in its, um, in its protocol, in its uh, general behavior, um, stayed exactly the same. It generates the same files. Um, it has the same fields in the, in the syslog messages. Everything stays the same for 30 years. And the question is, um, how can that be? Now, um, with the journal, uh, we created something that is, that, uh, uh, whose job is logging, much like syslog. But what works in, in, in many ways um, very differently from that. We added that to systemd because we needed it uh, that way. But the big question is, why in detail did we do that? Um, so. Uh, Basically, um, um, systemd is about service management, right? Uh, service management means um, we start a service and uh, we track its state and we st restart it and uh, all these kind of things and we expose the current state of the service to the user, to the administrator, so that the administrator can see in, in, in uh, one look what is actually the current state of the service. Um, is it behaving normally? Does it have any problems? Um, and so on and so on. It's, it's about supervision, basically. Um, when we created Systemd, we, um, of course, uh, built all of that into the, into, Systemd, into the Systemd core. But we noticed one thing, something we really wanted to do is in the output of system control status, system control status, if you have not uh, worked yet with Systemd, is the, the primary command how you can, can uh, get the state, the current uh, um, runtime state of a service. Um, it shows you something like, yeah, these processes are running for the, for the services and um, these are the parameters and has been running since this time and it's totally healthy and these kind of things. And we wanted to show, um, along with uh, the, the, classic, the, the current output of system control status, we wanted to show the last 10 log lines because that is the most crucial information about um, service health. Um, if you want to know if Apache works fine, the best way to figure out is to show the log lines of it, the last ones. Um, and if they are about errors, um, then you can figure out what's going on and why it's going on. So um, that is basically the central problem we had. It sounds completely trivial, just showing the 10 most recent log lines of Apache. But uh, it kind of um, uh, uh, forced us into um, checking again if syslog is actually what we want. Because it's actually extremely hard to implement with classic syslog. Because classic syslog basically dropped everything in var log messages, or like the distributions have different file names for that. But um, effectively, they, they uh, dropped um, all the logs in, uh, in uh, var log in some text file. But there was no way to figure out who actually generated which messages. Um, who, as in uh, what service did that. Because syslog doesn't actually have any idea about services. It doesn't even have any idea about processes. Like um, some daemons are nice and p send over the, their own process information. Um, and even worse, um, all that stuff is not indexed. 
So basically, the only way how you can figure out the ta 10 most recent log lines is that you go linearly through the entire set of uh, um, uh, log messages, which can be a huge um, thing to do. And then it's a huge security problem. Because uh, via log messages, there is no authentication in any way. So any user, um, any user at all that has access to your system, can say, I'm Apache, and I have this uh, uh, log messages. And uh, as it turns out, syslog will just take that and log it away without verifying that uh, the one logging is actually the one he claims to be. So we had all these issues that uh, um, it's not indexed. We don't even have that information in the log files. It's completely um, fakeable by anybody who has access to the machine. Um, and so we figured, well, um, wow, this is, the, this is a huge problem. Uh, what do we do about this? Um, do we keep uh, syslog in the game or not? And we kind of postponed the whole question a bit. And then uh, from a different perspective, um, what we wanted to do is um, we wanted to have logging. Um, I mean, we're building an, an in system in a way uh, with systemd. We're build, building something that brings up the machine. So what we wanted is basically that the user has the, the ability to introspect the entire boot process. And the entire boot process means um, everything that happens when the kernel initializes, and anything that happens when the initial RAM disk initializes, anything that happens in the early boot process, anything that happens during run normal runtime. Now, as it turns out, classic syslog only um, covered the last bit of it. And uh, however, the first three parts of it are much more interesting regarding errors, usually. Because um, um, if your machine doesn't boot up, it usually doesn't boot up because something's wrong with your file system or something like that. But actually, the last components um, that syslog covered are usually the ones that are not essential to bring up the machine, and hence not um, so super interesting. So um, we looked at that and figured out, OK, we need to somehow provide sane logging during early boot. And syslog can't provide that for us. So um, back then, we, we, we came up with the, with the interim solution, which was uh, we shipped a tiny, tiny syslog stub, basically that uh, pretended to be syslog, and all it did it was uh, copying everything that was happening in the early boot process into the kernel log buffer. And then uh, everything was in the kernel log buffer, and ultimately, when normal syslog would start up, it would flush everything to disk. Now, the kernel people didn't really like that we were spamming the, like that's the way hey, they, they saw it, that we were spamming the, spamming the kernel log buffer with our user space messages. So the general problem remained. Um, syslog could not provide us with what we wanted. It couldn't index, it, couldn't, it wasn't reliable, it wasn't around. And so we figured out, well, OK, this all sucks. And then um, two years ago, um, my colleague, in, uh, like Kai Zivas, the other guy working in SystemD, and, and I, and another friend, um, we visited a couple of uh, companies in the US, um, including uh, like really big um, movie um, studios, and, and actually also Google. And uh, we wanted to know. So what are your issues with, with logging, actually? And, and they all have really big installations. And um, usually what they tend to say is, yeah, logging is a very different thing for us than it's for everybody else. Um, because uh, for them, not the individual error um, is important, but um, mostly just trends. And um, for that um, reason, they turn off logging entirely. Now, and they also said that they're actually kind of interesting, like, like they often turn it off entirely. They, they, they are actually kind of interested in, in, in those trends. But um, with classic syslog, they can't actually implement that. Because classic syslog has this problem that if you look at the network story of classic syslog, it focuses on a push model. So as soon as an error takes place, the local syslog daemon will forward that um, to a central um, syslog daemon. So basically, it is the client that decides when to send the message. And uh, also, this usually tends to take place with uh, some unreliable transport. So if the server doesn't listen, the message is lost, which is not much of a problem for Google because they're mostly interested in trends. But the general problem um, is, uh, it states that it is the client that decides when to send something to a central server. Now, if you have a big setup with uh, more than a handful of servers, then uh, this turns out to become a real problem. Because if something happens across a network, maybe you, you turn on your entire network at the same time. Um, and a lot of messages are generated at the same time. You basically generate your end up with a DOS that is, shouldn't be a DOS. Because it, it basically, the clients are the ones that suddenly bombard the central server with its messages. So um, 
of course, you can, you can always scale your syslog servers with the worst case you expect. And uh, you can get quite far. But the thing is, um, as soon as you have more than 100 servers or something like that, this becomes a serious problem. You, you cannot scale your, your syslog server fast enough. So the entire model is, is, is backwards, um, in a way. Instead of immediately forwarding everything to a central server when it happens, what you have to do is turn things around and implement a pull mode. So basically, um, all the servers keep their logs all the time. I mean, they t tend to do that anyway. Um, but uh, the central server needs to pull out the data um, when it wants to, and then centralize it and, and, and do whatever um, the server needs to do. Um, this, of course, is not the model how this log works. Um, so anyway, from these three perspectives, um, we figured out, oh my god, syslog, since 1983, unmodified, does not cut it for us. It's not what we want. It's not what we need. It's not what we can build proper service management with. So, yeah. Um, that's basically what caused us to come up with, um, with um, uh, uh, the thing called the journal. Um, so yeah, it's about the general structure, as mentioned. Um, then, um, of course, um, uh, structure um, also means we wanted to have structured logging. Um, the background of this is classic syslog only knows one single form of how you can log your stuff, um, which is basically um, a date, which doesn't even include a time zone, um, a, a host name, a PID, um, and a tag, which is usually a process name, plus a message that is completely undefined in what, it, what, what comes there. Um, now, the problem with that is, um, depending on what you have, you probably want to log a lot more structure. For example, if you're in a SLinux system, you want to um, log the SLinux label of what's happening. If you're on a Unix system, you probably want to log who is doing that, meaning which UID, um, um, who is doing that, meaning which PID, who is doing that, which service, who is doing that, um, which audit um, session ID, who is doing that, who, uh, which audit trail um, ID, and, and things like that go on and on and on. It's basically, if you want to have useful log data, the three bits that you get with syslog are, are simply not sufficient because you want to want to index by a lot of more. And then you have the problem that uh, that uh, depending on the application, you might even have more, want to more, uh, more specific stuff um, for the application. Think about Apache. When Apache logs something that some, some module it loaded has a, couldn't connect to the database or something like that, you probably um, not only want to have this information um, um, spit out by Apache, but you probably want to have it structured as well. So that Apache says, well, and this was for this virtual host, and this was the Apache module which generated it. So the summary is that you want a lot more structure in your messages. Um, a simple string is often not, not enough. You want all the metadata so that you can index it by. And then um, if somebody wants to know, OK, what, what, what um, kind of problem did this Apache module get generated, so you have it indexed over that and can query it in one step and get all the errors that that one Apache module generated. Another issue is um, actionable events. Actionable events basically means that uh, you can actually recognize errors in the log and can act on, uh, upon them. So this is um, one frequent um, problem that, that administrators are really interested to read from the journals are disk errors. Um, basically that, uh, um, yeah, um, when, a, when a sector is dead in the, in the file system, in the, in the, in the uh, block devices, that the file system reports that in the logs and says, OK, here, so there's a bad sector. So that the administrator can then see that and uh, can eventually replace the disk. Um, the thing is, right now, the only way how that is, how is, that is um, reported to the administrator is in a text-based string, in an English language. And the English language sucks to parse um, from computers. Now, um, administrators um, handle this problem by writing regexes. And uh, so they wrote regexes that match exactly the English language that the kernel generates when a sector is bad. Now, of course, that model completely sucks because, um, yeah, regex regexes are hard to write. Regexes are usually not specific to the actual error, and uh, so on and so on. So what we wanted in the journal is that we actually have identifiers on the messages that themselves that make it easy to recognize certain kind of messages. So that, um, yeah, the sector bad uh, message has one identifier and if you want to have all the sector ba bad uh, messages 
and that ever happened, then you can, can uh, query it by that, and you get all the um, responses of whatever ha uh, happened. And similar for all the other events that happen. For example, whenever a user logs in, whenever a user logs out, whenever the system is rebooted, we want an actionable event, something that you can bind an action to and have a sane ID that you can key this off. So yeah, if you put all of this together, you figure out, OK, um, we are now at this point where fixing syslog is not that easy anymore, because it's fundamentally, um, let's say, outdated in its, in its model, like in the fact that it uh, clearly focuses exclusively on a push model and not on a pull model. Um, of course, um, I'm not saying that the push model was interesting. It's a, it's a really important thing to cover as well. But the thing is, um, as soon as you go into the cloud, into the bigger setups, you need the pull model. So um, we, we figured out all of this and said, OK, this is, this is probably the point where which we should say, yeah, this is beyond the point where we can fix this log. This is probably the point where we start thinking about something new. And then we did that. And that's called the journal. Um, now, the journal we introduced was uh, was uh, systemd version beginning of last year. And uh, since then, it has been in part of Fedora 16 and 17. And uh, no, sorry, and of Fedora 17 and Fedora 18. Um, you can just use it there if you want. Um, the way it's configured, though, is that it will log exclusively to slash run. That means to memory and not to, to um, persistent disk. Unless you turn that on, that it um, logs to persistent disk, which we will do with Fedora 19 by default. Um, if you, the, 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 the way how you uh, can turn it on, I will show you later. Um, but basically, um, logging things to RAM is sufficient to show the last 10 log lines um, in system control status, but um, will only, of course, give you half the interesting bits. Of course, um, by redesigning the entire logging system, we also fixed a couple of other things at the same time. For example, we always believed that um, things like uh, dumping core should also be just an actionable event structured like any other. So we actually wanted to have the ability that we can store huge objects, meaning core dumps, binary objects in the journal as well, um, so that they become just one log message like any other, or rotated by the same mechanisms, and so on and so on. Rotation, by the way, is another thing that is, um, we believed, inherently broken in the classic syslog model. Because in the classic syslog model, um, log files are rotated exclusively by time. So basically, every, every six hours or whatever your distribution is configured, um, uh, the, the log rotate tool or something similar will come, um, look at the log files, rotate them away, compress them, and then uh, things go on as they went before. Now, what you probably want is, uh, instead of having this time-based thing, you want have, having something that is strictly based on, on, uh, on disk space. Because in most cases, it's probably n no point in, in removing really old stuff if you only have very little stored. And the other thing is um, all of that needs to happen synchronously. Meaning, at the time the log, ma uh, the log server tries to write something to disk, it needs to check if the disk actually is, um, uh, or what the disk usage currently is, and rotate before it writes the next thing. Because the classic model had this problem that uh, if something logged a ton load of data in a very short period of, of time, this would fill up the disk, and only when the next rotation time um, took place, it would actually be cleaned up. So you have a bit of a, of a vulnerability there. Simply because the, the rotation interval is too long, you end up with um, uh, allowing clients to spam your disk, and you won't do anything about it immediately. So um, it's another issue that we, we try to fix. So moving things strictly based on disk usage and doing things uh, synchronously so basically, at the time you write, you first check if everything's OK. Um, so um, most of this talk, I actually want to uh, focus on uh, or spend on uh, actually playing around with the journal to show you what it actually can do. So um, a couple of uh, days ago, in preparation for this talk, actually, I prepared a blog story, um, which I can only recommend um, to look into, which just shows a couple of tricks that you can do with the journal. Um, of course, um, in that blog story, because blog stories are supposed to be short, I generally only show the command lines you type, but never how they actually behave in real life. So um, this is something I want to do now. I actually want to show you guys um, how you use um, the journal and how it actually feels if you use it. So um, yeah. By the way, if you guys have any questions, of course, interrupt me right away. 
or before we get started here with the demoing part, um, there are questions over there. Uh, well, at least in, I didn't know in FreeBSD you can uh, also rotate by size, so your log file gets uh, yep. one megabyte. It's you can actually um, you can actually do that on, on most uh, Linux distributions as well. It'll rotate by the space and not by time. But the thing is, it's still not um, the default, and it's still not um, done synchronously. So basically, you still have the thing that it will wait six hours before it actually will rotate by disk. So it's not super useful. But uh, yeah, there's more. Well, even even with syslog, um, most applications have their own logs and never use syslog. Uh, have to, do you have the question that uh, applications like Apache uh, are going to start using this, or what's your plan about that? Okay, so the, the, that is actually a real problem, the fact that we have so many different log files currently. We have the syslog log files, we have UTMP, we have WTMP, we have last log, we have the audit log files, and we have all the various things that the applications log into. My general approach to that is, um, yes, we absolutely should centralize that. For example, um, stuff like UTMP, WTMP, audit, there's really no point in splitting that off. The question, of course, is um, do we want to pull everything from the various um, applications into it? My question is probably, but not all. So um, what I think is Apache, for example, the error log of Apache should absolutely belong in the journal because that is administrator information. Um, the, the access log of Apache, um, people can do too if they want to. But I'm much less interested in to have that in there. I mean, it's, it's not something that I myself would work on to, to get in there, simply because um, it's, not actually, it's, not, it's not actionable stuff that the administrator needs, needs to know. It's mostly accounting for, for, for page hits and these kind of things. So um, yeah, it might make sense. And uh, people can do with a journal what people want to do with a journal. So um, if they want to, yeah. But it's not the pressing issue that I see in, in that case. Um, that said, um, I mean, there are many, many demons around in this world, and I think most of them should probably start logging just with everything else, so that we have everything centralized, everything have, uh, um, indexed, and that if people want to filter, they filter on display instead of um, on, uh, during storage. Um, so, um, yeah, so that, that administrators can have different views on the log data and can show different things interleave the way they want instead of having to do that um, already um, when you store them. Any further questions at this point? Otherwise, I'll go on to the demos. Um, by the way, what I wanted to add, um, one thing um, before we go get starting with the demos. The question is, of course, um, compatibility. Compatibil compatibility matters a lot. Um, compatibility um, means you need to make sure that, that if you introduce something like the journal, that all the old applications, when they log, things end up in the journal. You also need to make sure that uh, people want to get uh, stuff out of the journal and into classic syslog that they can do that. So um, what uh, the journal can do is, and does by default, is um, for every message it receives, regardless how it receives that, it will forward it immediately to a local syslog daemon if there is one running. If there isn't, it won't do that, of course. Um, what the journal will not do is um, speak the actual network protocol of syslog. Um, the reason for that is that it's very, very loosely defined. It's a very widely adopted protocol, like every router you can, can buy probably speaks the syslog um, protocol in one way or another. But the thing is, um, they all speak it in a different way. And because that is the way it is, we kind of try to avoid to get into that mess. And we say, basically, if you care about the network um, protocol of, uh, of uh, classic syslog, then use an implementation of the classic syslog protocol, meaning run our syslog side by side with the journal. So our response to, to uh, the compatibility issue is, yes, we will take in everything that we get on the system, including all the local syslog messages. We will forward them to the classic stuff. Um, so um, you can choose to run the traditional stuff side by side um, instead of um, replacing it. Uh, entirely. So um, it's, it's basically compatibility by reusing the old um, services instead of compatibility by emulation. Okay, so um, if there are no questions, then let's go get started with the demoing. Um, I have the block story that I was talking about actually here. Can you actually read that? Let's close that thing. 
Um, I think, yeah, you probably can read it, at least part of this, I hope. So basically, it's a, it's a blog story about um, using the journal. Um, let's quickly go through what I actually wrote there. Um, so I, I already mentioned that in Fedora um, 17 and 18, um, persistence logging, persistent logging is not enabled, and you have to enable it manually. You do that with that one simple command. It's basically just creating that directory, and if, if the journal sees that that directory exists, then it will um, store its data inside of it instead of just in slash run. And then, of course, you can choose that you remove the old syslog, which is yum remove r syslog, but you don't have to um, if you, if you want to keep the old stuff running side by side. It will just work, and you will not lose anything. So let's get started. The first command we'll just execute is the Let's, uh, can you read that? Yeah, you can. Um, so the, the command to, to actually read the journal files with is journal control. If we invoke that, then it looks like shit because uh, uh, it doesn't really fit on the screen here because we have the lower resolution. But uh, basically what this does, if you invoke journal control, is it gives you the pixel-perfect copy of the traditional output that Valog messages included, um, which you can then build off. So if you look at this, um, yeah, this is exactly how Valoc messages looked, with the date, with the host name, with the process name, with the PID, and uh, with the message. We can actually, because this is auto-paged like Git and, and, and all the new kernel tools and things like that do, and or man do, you can actually just use um, uh, less here to scroll to the right and see the rest of the messages. What you will notice is, um, yeah, for the first time, we actually make use of the fact that um, Long messages actually come with a priority value. And we'll store that away in the journal, and we use that to color things. So basically, everything that you see in white here is highlighted because it's a warning or notice message. And everything that is red here is actually an error message. So um, we visualize this information that is traditionally lost in Valog messages. And uh, this is actually already really useful, because if you then scroll through this thing here, you can easily see all the issues there, like all the real problems. Of course, as it turns out, because uh, um, we previously didn't really um, expose this information um, in Valog messages, um, in many cases, the priority value is currently set to bullshit values. Like in the kernel especially, um, a lot of kernel drivers lock something at the highest block level possible, even though it's no problem at all. But now that we made this visible, this will hopefully be, be fixed um, in one way or another. Here's another feature. Because we have all, everything nicely um, indexed, we can actually recognize reboots nicely. So um, we will insert this line here every time you reboot. It's really, really awesome. It's really trivial to do if you have this all indexed. But I mean, how amazing is that? Um, yeah, you can, can scroll through this. Um, it's really awesome. But um, if, if I run this, it begins with something that's kind of old. It's from the 18th of October. That is because um, by default it will show you everything, everything that ever was. And that includes everything that is rotated. So this is very much unlike Valoc messages. Because at Valoc messages, you usually focus only on the last um, log file. And the rotated stuff is compressed and, and not as easily accessible. Um, of course, you can always access it by, by using different commands and then first decompressing and these kind of things. But um, um, the journal always looks at everything. This is, of course, pretty. Um, annoying sometimes, because if you just invoke journal control, you see really old shit that you're not interested in anymore. That's why we introduced a command like, can you actually read this? I hope so. I can still increase the font if that's useful. Um, but then even less fits on the screen. So journal control dash b is a really simple command if you invoke that. It will actually start with the current boot. So uh, what you see here is the message from the, from the current boot, which I booted on the 26th of October and have only suspended since then. Um, so yeah, that's a really simple thing. You can actually just look at the um, logs that were generated um, from the current um, boot. Let's, um, yeah, uh, another thing, um, of course, we try to keep things um, similar to how um, things were done in Valog messages. So if you use this journal control tool, you can actually use this, journal control dash F, and if you use that, that's exactly like using tail-f on the, on the classic Valog messages files. And we'll just output things as they happen. So if we now open a new terminal and do logger 
log uh, foo, you will actually see, see, it immediately was shown on this thing. Um, of course, um, tail f f dash f is not the only thing that people um, used to do with um, the classic valid message files. The other thing is they did um, dash n um, to show the last lines. So let's do that too. Let's do n19. And that's what happened. It will show you the last 19 lines. So this is kind of boring so far. I mean, so far we only do what classic syslog could do. Of course, actually, we can do much more. For example, the other thing is because we actually care about time zones, um, you will notice that actually the times shown there are actually um, translated to your local time zone, which is a huge problem with current syslog because the current syslog does not include time zone information in the in the network protocol. So um, if you have a have a global um, um, setup of machines, you always get confused completely by the time zones because everything's in a different time zone. Um, shit. Um, so um, let's do some basic filtering. Um, I already showed where's the other. Somehow this is not really easy to do with one hand. Um, I already showed you this, which shows the current boot errors. But um, often, uh, if you really want to know what's currently going on with your computer, uh, what you want to do is you want to match by all errors. So what we can do here is we can specify dash p or r. Dash p is for priorities, and r means all the, the errors and worse. And if we do that, that's what we, see, we get. We only get red messages, of course, because that's how we highlight things. And we can see all the errors here. And we see this is a bug in, in, in the system depackaging, basically. And we see all kinds of issues here. So this is already highly useful. So um, if you're an administrator and just want to figure out, so I just booted on my machine, what happened? Um, you can just use this filter, and suddenly you get only the stuff that's actually interesting. Um, we can filter by time. Um, shit. Um, so we can say, I only want the stuff that happened since today in the morning. And then we do this. And um, so you, uh, if you saw what I did, I said dash dash since today. Today is a special string that means um, today at um, uh, uh, midnight, basically. Or I can specify a date. Let's say I want to have everything since 2012, October um, 27th. Then I can do that. And then the first thing you see is the 27th. Um, or I can do, I want everything since 48 hours, I like in the time 48 hours ago. And then it starts at uh, October 26th. So you can do things um, filtering in time. You can also do it the other way around. Let's say I only want the um, stuff that happened um, in the last 48 hours until the last 24 hours. So I specify since minus 48 hours until minus 24 hours. And that's what I get. And then if I go to the end, yeah, it stops at the 28th. Um, what else can we do? Of course, one of the reasons we did all this was to shit. Why? This is really weird. Yeah, I probably should do that. And I will do that next. So, um, of course, the, the one of the main reasons we did this all because we wanted index by, index by service. So let's do that. Let's, uh, with general control dash u, I can match by system the unit. The unit is just a fancy name for service. Um, so we want to know everything that Avahi um, logs. So we do that. General control dash u, Avahi daemon. And see, those are all the messages from Avahi daemon. Of course, in this case, um, the process name is actually the same as, as the service name, so this uh, might not be the best example. But you get what's going on here. And you will get all the data from the first one. And of course, we rebooted in between, so we'll get the reboot message. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. Um, what else can we match? Let's see further so example that I put together here. OK, this one is actually a little bit fake, like journal control def SDC. Because the problem is, um, this will work very soon, but currently the kernel is not ready for it. Um, so basically, the idea is we want to have everything indexed, uh, like kernel messages indexed by the device they are about. So um, this is the, the, the uh, primary example number one. That's why I put it in there. Um, yeah, 
if you, if you have a disk, then you want to be able to say, I want all messages from that disk. And if you type journal control def SDC, you will actually get that, ex except that right now the kernel doesn't actually generate the, 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 the metadata for that. But the patch is already posted. And um, we'll have that maybe even by the time Fedora 18 is released. And then it's going to work. Um, so now I'm going to close this. Um, what was the next thing that I wanted to show? OK, um, here's very basic filtering. I want to see everything that, um, um, let's remove that, that the, uh, the VPNC daemon generated. So I can just type here the uh, binary name of it. Um, let's add an asp in there, and then it will actually work. So this can easily match by the process name of the process that uh, um, logged. And so in this case, this will easily give me everything that exactly that process with that pass generated. And it's reliable and non fakeable And uh, what else can we do? Now, uh, of course, um, we can always um, um, merge matches. So in this case, um, we showed everything that the user Aspen VPNC binary logged. Now let's mix that up with everything that um, the DH client um, um, generated. So we, we specify, simply specify both names on the, on the command line, and then you will see both. You will see everything that DH client logged, everything that VPNC client, and will be properly interleaved, and it's DH client time again, and VPNC at time. Everything proper interleaved by the timestamps. Kind of cool already. But now, let's uh, have a closer look on what you can actually do for really awesome things. Um, of course, what I showed so far was this pixel perfect copy of the classic Varlog messages output, like this one, with the exception that we add color if you, if you show things on a, on a, on a um, terminal. Turns out, um, the junk control actually has many ways to output things. Like the, the, the default mode is the classic Varlog messages mode, but there's also another one, which is called the verbose mode. If you, if you enable the verbose mode, then you will actually see for, for the same messages that you saw otherwise, but you will see all the metadata. So let's see, if I, if I just type that Varlog um, uh, journal control dash o verbose, then I see all the messages in the details. So now you will recognize that these messages are basically, they feel a little, little bit like the environment block, like, you know, those things that where you do export and, and stuff like that. So in this case, you see these are all the fields that are actually um, uh, stored for the first message in, in, in the journal store. Um, these fields, basically, underscore com is basically the process name that the kernel has for there, the thing that you see in top. Um, um, CMD line is the full command line. It's the thing that you see in, uh, in uh, PS. And uh, underscore exe is the binary name, actually. Um, the thing that is, was actually executed, um, like where the, where the binary was read from disk. You see the PID, you see the UID, you see the GID, um, you see audit information, you see system information such as the session or, or whatever generated. You see as a Linux information, you get the original kernel timestamp, you get information about the machine, like which is the current boot, like the Linux kernel assigns a random number to every boot, and this is the one that is stored. Um, the machine ID, which is something like the, the host name, except that it's um, not as, it's, uh, it's, it's much more unique than the host name, and the host name itself. Then up there, you see the actual contents, like the priority. Like the priority is a classic syslog priority, which ranges from, from debug to, to super alert or something like that. Um, the syslog facility, the identifier, which is a small thing that is usually the process name, and the actual message is this part of the thing. So if you know that this is the structure, then you can suddenly use this for actually filtering in the database by any of these fields specified. So let's see. Um, I want to see all the messages that were generated by UID 0, yeah? which means all messages generated by root. Now we can easily do that. We invoke journal control and just say, I want all messages where UID equals 0. And if we do this, that's what we get. We got the classic output, but these are all messages from privileged um, UID 0 things. So of course, that's kind of boring. Let's do that with my user ID. If I type that, 
that suddenly this is only stuff that my user Leonard, which is user ID 500, logged. Um, of course, um, if we look at this, let's see by what else do we want to um, filter. Let's say we want to filter by, um, I don't know, what, uh, what's the host name? Well, the host name, everything that I logged here is by the host name. But um, let's uh, log something by SL Linux, con uh, match something by SL Linux context. I want to have everything that the SL Linux context uh, of, uh, let's say, Avahi again, logged, and I want to see it all. So what we can do is um, we actually have a command line completion for journal control. So you can type underscore s and press tab, and it will show you all the fields that start with this. And we say as a Linux context. And now we wonder, so what, what again was the, 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 the as a Linux context we wanted to match? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we can just uh, choose it here, because we have command line completion about the field values, actually, as well. So um, there we go. We want to match by Avahi. Let's take that. Um, so no, this is all index stuff, so you, you can't really do that. Um, you can, uh, I mean, you can use grep afterwards, of course, but um, the thing is you can't really optimize um, wildcards that nicely. So this is just by exact matches, um, but uh, what you apply afterwards is completely up to you. Um, so yeah, um, and of course we can combine this again. Let's say we want to match something else. Let's say we, we want to have everything from one single boot. And uh, yeah, then we type in the boot ID um, field and press tap, and these are all the boots that are currently stored in the, in the journal. As mentioned, the boot ID is basically just a, it's a UID that the kernel at every boot assigns to that specific runtime, and you can use that basically to identify the boot. So uh, we want to see all the stuff that was logged by SL, uh, with this SL Linux context at that boot, and there we go, that's, that's it. And um, yeah, what else can we do? Of course, um, sometimes, um, let's, so, so what I showed here basically is um, I combined this match for the SL Linux context with this match for the boot ID. In this case, it's an AND match. It will show only the messages that match both of these matches. Uh, we can actually um, do something different as well. Let's say I want to show all the messages generated by UID 70 or 71. So first we match by UID. Um, of course, I can use tab completion here again. Um, so you see that this is the possible values of the UID. Let's say I want to match everything from UID 70. Um, uh, user ID 70 is, again, the Avahi user. Um, so I, I always end up using Avahi as my, for my demos. I guess I'm a little bit biased um, in, in regards to Avahi. So let's, um, oops, that's not the right syntax. Um, now let's match UID 70 or UID 71. As you will notice, it's completely sufficient to just write this and this on the same command line. And journal control will actually figure out if you mean and or or in the usual case. Um, it's, it's very simple, actually. If you specify the same field name twice, it assumes that you mean or. If you um, specify different field names, it will assume that and. So in this case, um, we got everything from UID 70 and UID 71. And that's a Vahi demon. I actually don't know what 71 is. Um, but yeah, you get the idea. Um, of course, sometimes this implicit logic of or and and um, is not good enough. Sometimes you want to actually use explicitly um, merge two different things. So what you can actually do is um, use the plus sign. The plus is basically the union of two matches. It will show you the message that match everything before the plus and everything that, mat uh, that, that matches the stuff behind the plus. So we can uh, um, add another match here. Let's say, what do we want to match? Um, let's say everything that was locked by the kernel. So um, uh, basically, what you see here now is everything that's locked by the kernel. It's a little bit confusing because systemd in this time is configured to lock via the kernel. But basically, um, with this command that I was shown, what you will get is um, everything locked by UID 70, everything locked by um, UID 71, plus everything that was locked by the kernel, uh, via the kernel. So um, this is already pretty awesome. Um, 
Of course, you can do all kind of other fancy things. Like on the command line, you can use um, dash f, this other case f, and uh, specify any field name you want, like for example, underscore uid. And it will show you all the possible values. This is internally used for the, for the, for the command line completion, because basically, yeah, it's, it's really awesome to know what, what values um, a certain field can take. Um, by the way, a little bit of explanation I think deserves. Let's, if we use the, the Bose output mode again. I think it deserves a little bit of explanation uh, why we named the fields the way we did. As you notice, uh, you probably noticed, you see that some fields here have this underscore in, in, in the beginning, and other fields do not have the underscore in the beginning. Um, the logic behind that is basically um, we have a couple of fields which are trustable because it is the journal which adds them based on kernel information so that the client cannot fake them. There's, the, there's fields basically starting with an underscore are precisely those. So um, if there is a, is, a, is a client that wants to log to the journal, um, then it can control only those fields that do not start with an with a underscore. So that's in this case the message, the syslog identifier, the syslog facility, and the priority. These four fields are basically the ones that come from the client side. All the other ones um, are added by the server side automatically about the client, and the client cannot fake them. So the, the, the effect of this is basically that if you want to match against everything that UID um, 0 logged, then you can do this, and you can be absolutely sure that the client will not fake that. Um, so that's, that's kind of simple. Um, let's have a look at um, another output mode of journal control. Because we, we live in the world of the cloud and, and, and the web and things like that, uh, we actually have an um, output mode that can actually output JSON for you. So if you type this, then you'll see the very same information simply formatted as JSON, um, which is really useful to, to, to uh, use um, from other applications, whatever you want to do. So it can, can process it in, in all kinds of script and things like that. Um, we have another output mode, actually, that is um, the relative output mode. Um, but I think it's actually called short relative. And the short monotonic, sorry. Um, so the short monotonic mode, OK, this actually shows a bug that I fixed the other day. Um, the monotonic mode will actually use monotonic timestamps. Time so uh, meaning that instead of showing you the calendar time of what happened, it will actually show you um, the, the time spent since boot until this message was generated. So this is like um, 350 milliseconds after the machine was booted up. Um, so um, this is a nice thing that you can do with, with uh, journal control. You can actually change the output um, at the time you view instead of the time you store the data. So yeah, it's really nice, actually. It's, it's really nice to do performance measurements. Um, now, of course, um, what I showed you with the journal control right now, with journal control right now, is that you can have this index thing that is really, really awesome um, to use because you have the command line completion. You can actually query things the way you are, and it's not fakeable, and all these kind of things. Um, but this, um, what I want to speak about in the last five minutes or so, would at least just give you a little bit of a demo. Um, the network model of of uh, of uh, the journal is bound to, to modern technologies such as HTTP and JSON. Um, meaning, basically, we have a way how you um, can access the journal via the web, which is this kind of thing. Um, so basically, the network model of, uh, of uh, the journal is basically just a little, tiny, embedded HTTP server where you can request with GET that it will um, serialize all the messages to you. Of course, because this is really easy, and um, you can also, you get it, can get it in various formats, actually. You can get it via JSON or even in the classic format. Because it's really easy to do, I actually hacked up a little bit of an HTML5 app, which actually makes use of this, and um, which if you access that mini um, HTTP server, you can actually browse through your logs with. So um, yeah, you can, you can filter will show you the possible things by what you filter all your services. Let's say I want to filter by network manager, then I can easily do that. And you can say only from the current boot and these kind of things. I hope this is in any way readable. Now, um, the way how you can access the, the stuff is actually, let's see that. Mm. 
So um, this mini HTTP server, which by, uh, by the way is of course not enabled by default because that would be in the security hole, you can actually um, access directly from the shell. So if you type this, uh, this uh, URL localhost with the port number that we used, 19,531, um, and slash entries, you can actually get to download all the, the log messages from the, from the thing. This now will generate a huge, huge, huge file. And if we look into that file, you see it's Wallog messages from the scene, the thing. So this is basically how we want to make the, the, the networking work. It's just, um, yeah, if you want to pull out the logs of a, of, a, of a system, you just basically invoke an HTTP request, and that's what you get. Um, this is actually really, really fancy to use, because we provide you with cursors. Cursors are basically a stable way to address a specific log ma uh, line in the, in, the, in, the, in the log stream. So basically, if you want to uh, write something that synchronizes the, the logs from one machine to another, then uh, you can just use those cursors and uh, always continue exactly from the spot where you left off. So um, this HTTP stuff is actually really easy to use and uh, fancy because you actually can, with HTTP headers, even say that you want um, uh, JSON instead of this classic text format. And you can simply say that by specifying the MIME type of JSON as what you accept. And uh, yeah, let's cancel that in the middle. And if we then look what we got, we got JSON objects. Oops, see, um, yeah. So um, that's actually all really cool. Um, we'll beef that up um, so that we can have live syncing. Um, it's actually really useful for embedded devices as well, because if you develop an embedded device with systemd, you can just enable this micro HTTP server, which again is completely optional. It's compile time optional, runtime optional, and not enabled by default. But if you enable that, then it's actually really useful if you develop an embedded device, because you can just turn this on and um, you have a live output of the log file simply by directing your web browser to .wget or curl or whatever you like, and we'll just output you everything it has. Um, my time is basically over. Let's do a little bit more questions first in the last remaining three minutes or so. Is there also a new API, uh, libc API, to generate logs? Um, yes and no. So um, our emphasis is definitely on, on uh, um, compatibility. So if you want to log, you can use the classic syslog um, um, uh, a library call from the uh, libc. Um, if you use that, we will add a lot of this implicit structure that I mentioned, like the UID and PID and stuff like that. So you get a lot of benefits by simply doing that. But of course, what you cannot do with the classic syslog thing is um, log in structured information um, from your app. Like, for example, in this example that I mentioned where Apache should, uh, in the, like, like, as structured metadata pass the, the, the virtual host information and the Apache module information and things like that, that you can't do with classic syslog um, call. So we provide a simple API for that. Actually, um, uh, I think the day before yesterday, I posted a blog story about that. So I can only invite you um, to have a look at that. It will show you how, how you um, uh, can can uh, also log to the journal with structured data. It's a really, really simple API, actually. We, we spend a lot of time making this as simple as possible, and I think we, we came up with a really nice way to do that. Um, there are even more C APIs. For example, there's a C API how we can actually, actually access the journal. Um, it's also very, very simple. So basically, you, you just have to open the journal, and you specify your filters with uh, one library call each, and you go through in a, in a very simple loop and you get all the data, by, data out of it, and we'll actually give you all data. We will not, not uh, hide anything from you. So, um, yeah, we have C APIs. Um, I have a bit more questions. Well, I noticed uh, that reboot line. So uh, there wasn't uh, logged the time of reboot. Is it possible to log that? Is it possible to uh, log shutdown time? Can I ask more questions? Or uh, let, let me answer that first and then and ask again. Um, so um, basically, I mean, sometimes you don't have a message when the machine was actually turned off, but we generate a, a message when we um, finish booting up, and that has a timestamp attached to it. Um, but actually, that line is usually just shown when the boot ID changes. Like if, if the first message, like the f messages you see north of the line, has a different boot ID from the stuff that you um, see south of the line, then we know there was a reboot in between, and that's what we show. But we, as mentioned, we do log messages when we finish rebooting, so you could use that as timestamp. 
the second question is, I noticed you are using uh, since command line, which is probably inspiration from Git. Is it possible uh, that you add um, um, like some logic stuff that Git have, like uh, you put since two days ago, since three days ago, and such things? Um, uh, I already demoed that a little bit with this um, minus 48 hours. So we use a slightly different um, syntax there than, than Git. We, we, I actually looked into the Git parser, and the Git parser in some areas has very, very weird extensions. Like you can specify uh, two days ago at tea time. Um, you can actually specify that like um, two days ago is tea time. And yeah, I'm not sure I want to expose tea time in, in my parser so much. But uh, it's definitely inspiration. We try to, to, to provide the same thing and generally in the same syntax, but I'm not sure I've always in the same syntax. Like the, the, their syntax for relative um, timestamps is that they check at the end for the word ago. So that you, and I didn't really like that, but I don't know. Um, it, we, this is a relatively recent addition that we have this time parsing and we'll probably beef that up um, because people want different um, ways to specify that. Uh, the next one is uh, basically you are using the bus in the back. N no, uh, this is not. No. So, is it possible to communicate with the bus protocol with no? No. no. Okay. Um, so basically, um, this this um, we can't really use Dbus here in this uh, this um, um, use case because Dbus itself is a syslog client, and we can't really make make the journal a client to Dbus and Dbus a client to syslog because then we had a perfect circle and things would deadlock all the time. So um, the journal does not actually use Dbus in any way. Uh, we would like to for some things. For example, it would be cool if we could have a Dbus interface where people can ask for rotation or, and, and reconfigure things and these kind of things. But uh, we can't. Um, we hope to fix that one day when finally Dbus enters the kernel and will become just the kernel facility because then it won't have to log that way. Um, but so far, this, this, this hasn't taken place. Okay, and uh, one more question. Uh, I noticed you showed demo also line filtering. Uh, is it possible to are actually, are there plans to add regex support inside filtering? Um, I think, as, yeah, this, this was, 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 was asked for before, if we can have wildcards and stuff. So the thing is that we, it's really hard to, 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 to optimize that. We, we cannot build indexes that can match all the regexes possible. Um, so our current reply to that, if you want to filter anything beyond the, the stuff that we index, just use grab. Um, but of course, it doesn't fully um, cut it simply because, like, if you want to do the verbose stuff, uh, like the the, the meta information, but you use the classic output, then you can't match for the meta information, of course. Um, so yeah, we'll probably add something like this. It's totally on the on the table. But of course, we kind of want to get the signal across that if you use that, um, it's totally useful. But uh, keep in mind, it's not indexed, so it's going to be slow. It's going to be O of n complexity instead of um, O of uh, one, which is the rest of it, basically. I think I'm mostly over time, but. Um, if we have one more question, I would answer that. Otherwise, I would say no questions at all. Otherwise, I would say thank you very much for your time. And, uh